Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Nikon F50 which in 1994 was the entry level camera in the Nikon SLR range of 35mm cameras. Uh, it combined very simple to use controls and a very stripped back user friendly interface with some more advanced features uh, that one could certainly grow into as a photographer as one became more familiar with advanced techniques. It's also fair to say that that specification was somewhat limited or capped in such a way that uh, one could ultimately also grow out of the camera. But before we get too far into that let's go ahead and uh, instead of putting a battery in first let's take a look at putting the lens on. Now being a uh, Nikon the lens goes on and off fairly conventionally but in the opposite direction so press the lens release button here and we turn the lens the opposite way to most other cameras. Now it's important with this camera to note that all the aperture control is done from the camera body and not from the aperture ring on the lens. So we need to make sure the lens aperture ring is set to f22 and you'll see that's colour coded in orange and this little switch here is moved down to the orange marker which locks the aperture ring. Sometimes uh, some Nikon lenses have a little twist dot or uh, dial there. Now aligning the lens with the camera body is fairly conventional. We've got an index point on the camera, which is a little black dot. And normally you'd find a little black dot on the back of the lens or a little red dot on the lens. Now kind of there is because this screw head here is painted black which is a bit of a clue but actually the lens index for lining up is a focus marker this little white line here so we line that white line with the black dot on the camera and we twist and again it's the other way around to most other camera models right having got the lens on let's go ahead and put a battery in the battery compartment as you'd expect is on the base it's a nice simple fold down flap and I'm pleased to say the camera uses a very sensible 2CR5 battery cell. Now I know a lot of people like cameras to run on alkaline cells, but we have to remember we've got a, a film winder, an autofocus motor and a flash unit, plus motorised film rewind, and you really need a battery with a little bit more oomph. Now these 2CR5 batteries, I have a, a flat side and a curvy side, so you can't put them in the camera the wrong way round, they won't go in. Uh, it is possible to put them in upside down, so it's important to note you want the metal contacts going into the camera first. And that just, there we go, closes up like that. All very simple stuff. So moving over to the top plate, I'm just going to move that over to that setting. On off, good old-fashioned button that says on or off we like that turn that on and we're away to the races little LED at this end uh, turns on that's a frame counter it says E for empty there's no film in the camera currently we're in auto exposure and if we were to go and take a picture it would give me a little warning here of probably the camera shake there we go you see that on the right hand side of the LCD hopefully that's pretty much it in the simple mode. I say simple mode because there's a little switch over here which has a green simple marker and then if you twist this little dial you get an advanced setting. But we'll come to that in a moment. In the simple mode we have access to a number of autofocus, uh, sorry I beg your pardon, a number of program modes and they're accessed with this little a little picture of uh, what might be thought of as a book or an instruction leaflet or indeed a menu. So if we press that button there we see this panel lights up with a number of little options. There are four fully automatic program modes here. Going from left to right we've got the standard automatic program then we've got a program that maximizes depth of field for a landscape and then there's a portrait program for of portraits that uh, minimizes depth of field, throws the background out of focus, 
and lastly there's one optimised for macro which again is biased towards more depth of field. You'll see there's flashing arrows and four buttons. Well let's say we want the macro mode we just press the button above the macro symbol and we go into macro mode and then if we want to change that we press the menu button again let's go into the standard auto mode and that's pretty much all the control we have in the simple mode so it's a point and press camera in that sense it's a point and shoot so if it was your first single lens reflex and you're a little bit nervous about lots of complicated controls and dials the simple mode eases you into uh, SLR photography and the four exposure or four program modes gives you some indication that you can bias the exposure for different subjects more so than for example with a compact camera there are a couple of little things we can do we've got a built-in flash unit let's operate from this button on the side here it doesn't pop up automatically when required uh, unlike some later cameras you do have to choose to turn it on so when you get the camera shake warning that's a good indication that you might want to use the flash uh, the instruction books also advise using flash if your subject is in shadow or strongly backlit uh, and that's a very good advice particularly if you're photographing the bride's mother-in-law at a wedding and she's wearing a wide brimmed hat and her face is in shadow a little burst of fill flash goes a long way and the only other control in the simple mode is a self timer we can activate that and it'll give us 10 seconds before it takes the picture and to turn it off we can just turn the camera off so all so far so good we can change the lens and we've got a fully automatic camera we've got a wide range of lenses available to us so comparing it to a a fixed lens even a zoom compact we've got way more lenses available and with faster apertures so if we were an estate agent we want to photograph property interiors we can put an ultra wide on there if uh, our children playing the football team soccer team if you're that way inclined you can put a, a telephoto lens on there much faster focusing much brighter than you'll find on the zoom compact if you're going away on safari and you're not really a photographer but you want to take nice pictures of the wild animals you can stick a relatively inexpensive 70 to 300 mil lens on there get much nearer to the to the wildlife than you would with a zoom compact but let's imagine a scenario where you've bought your f50 you've eased your way into slr photography and now perhaps you've read a magazine and you've seen a, a technique illustrated and you think oh, i'd quite like to try that i'd quite like to learn a bit more about it in fact what you want to do is something more advanced than point and shoot so that's why we go over to the advanced mode now it's pretty much business as usual if we press the menu button we get four exposure mode options but this time we've got program shutter priority aperture priority and manual uh, now they're all very self-explanatory i'm going to start with manual i don't know how well you can see that display but our four buttons now become up and down for the shutter speed which is very clearly displayed here and in the viewfinder the viewfinder display is excellent by the way uh, and then we've got up and down for the aperture value as well also repeated in the viewfinder in, uh, in manual exposure you get a nice little um, exposure meter in the viewfinder I'll try and get that on the viewfinder camera in a moment uh, gives you a very clear indication not just if you're correctly exposed but how far under or over you might be as well so that's quite nice so what else do we have tucked away here worth noting in manual mode the exposure metering is a traditional center weighted average so it's like buying a, a camera from uh, the sort of early 80s late 70s it's a normal if you want a better expression center weighted average metering mode when we go into one of the automatic modes in this case aperture priority the camera now uses a six section evaluative metering system or matrix metering as Nikon called it worth noting Nikon were the first people to have an SLR with an evaluative metering system and if you use a D series lens uh, you don't just get evaluative metering you get what Nikon call 3D 
matrix metering which is uh, even better. So a very clever exposure meter in this camera given it only cost around £200 for the body in 94. So aperture value, you choose an aperture, the camera will choose a complementary shutter speed and again it will give you a, a camera shake warning if that shutter speed uh, is likely to lead to a blurred picture. Go into menu, shutter priority, now you choose the shutter speed, the camera chooses the aperture. Worth noting that in shutter value, it's these two keys on the left that operate the shutter speed. In aperture value, it's the keys on the right that operate the aperture. And in manual, that convention remains. The left key is for shutter, the right key is for aperture. So these are always aperture keys if you're setting an aperture, these are always shutter speed keys if you're setting a shutter. Quite a nice design touch that. Uh, it means you're not going to get confused as to which button does what. Shutter priority and then lastly program. And things get a bit more exciting here. In the simple mode we had four program options. In the advanced mode we have eight. We've got our standard program which we'll come back to in a moment. We've got landscape and portrait and we've got a little navigate right option. We now get macro, so those are the four we've previously seen. Uh, a sports mode, biasing towards a faster shutter speed. I'm going to have to start reading these out because they get a bit complicated at this point. This palm tree, weirdly, is a silhouette mode. So it's intended for dramatic pictures of somebody against uh, a sunset or something of that nature. And you can see the sun's just setting over the LCD illustrative uh, palm beach thing. It's a sunset mode, but they call it a silhouette mode. There's then a night scene mode. Not quite sure how that differs from standard program, if I'm perfectly honest with you, but it's very likely that you'd want to have a, a, long, a tripod with you at that point. And then we've got this um, motion effect mode. Very similar, I'll run through those again in case it wasn't clear on the video, very similar to the uh, motion blurring mode we saw on the Canon T80 previously. So basically it's giving you a slightly longer shutter speed. So if you pan during exposure following a subject, uh, your subject stays sharp and the background blurs. But I'm going to go back now to the standard auto mode, standard program. This is slightly different to the standard program in the simple mode. You'll see the two up down arrow keys are illustrated or illuminated on the right here. And I can now move these keys up and down and we see we get this little P asterisk symbol come up. This is telling me that uh, I'm biasing the shutter speed or I'm biasing the exposure perhaps I should say either to a smaller aperture for greater depth of field or a faster shutter speed. So it's program exposure with program shift as it became known. So right now we've gone through all the exposure modes. Uh, it's worth noting the shutter speed range on this camera is uh, one two thousandth of a second down to 30 seconds. So when you get that camera shake warning it could be as long as 30 seconds. The shutter speed is always displayed in the viewfinder. And we'll look at using longer shutter speeds on this in a bit more detail because it's quite an interesting feature and also quite an irritating omission. But for now we'll go through the rest of the menu modes. So we looked at exposure modes in advanced. We also get some additional modes. So now if I go to the AF mode, I can choose a single shot or continuous autofocus. So if your subject moves or you reframe the image in continuous, then the focus will shift. In single shot, when you press the button and focus, it will stay at that distance until you release it and press it again. We've got manual ISO setting. And again, quite a nice design by Nikon here. There's a couple of little things the camera does that you wouldn't necessarily think it was going to do. So it has DX coding. When you put a DX coded film in, it will set the film speed for you. That DX coding range being between 25 ISO and 5000. If you put a non-DX coded film in, or you wish to override the DX coding, uh, you can do so in the ISO mode. And it will go anywhere from 6 ISO up to 64,000 ISO. 
So that's really quite a range uh, available to you on this camera, which is uh, quite impressive, uh, particularly if you want to use some of the weird and wonderful modern slow films, the CMS 20s and the other weird stuff that's out there. We've also in advanced mode got exposure compensation. Uh, I think it's plus minus five stops. Yeah, there you go, five stops in half stop increments. So again, a slightly more advanced exposure, uh, a slightly more advanced technique than you get in the simple mode. So really, we can start off as a point and shoot camera, uh, move into different exposure modes in the advanced function, override the exposure with exposure compensation or, or ISO control, and then we do get a, a, a time mode. So for very long exposures in manual. I mentioned it goes down to 30 seconds. Two seconds, 15. So there's 30 seconds. And then one step down, it says time. Many people will be familiar with a bulb exposure. Now, on cameras with bulb exposure settings, you press the button, the shutter button, and the camera op uh, opens the shutter. And it keeps the shutter open until you release the shutter button. Some cameras, notably older cameras, have a time mode. So you'll sometimes find very early cameras like the Kodak Vest Pocket Kodak. They have an I instantaneous shutter release and a T for time shutter release. So we're going to open the camera back and we're going to have a look at this time mode because it's pretty cool. One thing this camera doesn't have is a remote release socket or a cable release socket. That was very common on entry level SLR cameras at this time and was also quite annoying for a lot of people. Now if this had a bulb mode where you press and hold a button during the exposure you're going to jiggle the camera by holding the button down and there's no option but to hold the button down. But with the time mode it's a little bit different. When I press the shutter button I was able to release the button before the shutter actually opened and the shutter will stay open until I press it very lightly to close it. So if that's on a tripod, I've got a very good chance of releasing the shutter, didn't do that very well, and closing the shutter without jiggling it around. The other thing I can do, this little box will suffice, if I cover the lens, I can open the shutter, but I haven't started the exposure yet because the lens is covered. So I can start and stop the exposure without having to jiggle the camera at all. So it's a bit of a workaround for the lack of a shutter release button, uh, a remote release button I should say. But nonetheless, quite an interesting way of doing it. If you're not going to have a remote release button then that's pretty cool. So let's look at film loading. Obviously it takes standard 35mm film. Here's one we made earlier. Uh, and it's standard for really for one of these automatic cameras. You see there's a little red marker here. I don't know if you can see that. Put the film in the film chamber. Bring the leader over to the red marker, more or less. There we go, that'll do. Close the back, and away it goes. And it'll say number one. If it continues to say E, or it shows an ERR message, uh, then it didn't work. It's uh, try again. And that basically is the controls of a Nikon F50. Uh, just a couple more features to it. Single wind film advance. No continuous winding. Uh, I've had this autofocus turned off for uh, make the operation easier on camera. To turn the autofocus on, you just move that switch here to the AF mode, and then it will obviously focus. It won't fire the shutter until focus is achieved. With the self timer, turn that off. 
you get a blinky uh, red tally light, which I believe goes a bit quicker towards the last two seconds. It goes constant, beg your pardon. The film will rewind automatically at the end of the roll. It's obviously quite noisy, so it's worth bearing that in mind if you're in, uh, let's say, a quiet place. If you want to rewind it before the end of the roll, you've got that picture of Loch Ness and you've got to rush down to the chemist to get it developed. There's a, a, a rewind release button just here, so if you press that button in with something suitable, it will rewind the film for you. Now, as I say, this camera, when it was new, cost around about £200. And having eight program modes, three uh, other exposure modes, uh, a 6 to 6400 ISO range, five stop exposure compensation, time exposure mode, built in flash unit, uh, an excellent metering system, and an excellent flash metering system if you put an external flash unit on, all for £200 for the body. Uh, what a fantastic bargain. Now the truth is, all the manufacturers did a really good specification of camera as their entry level camera. And there's probably a reason for this. We've also seen that there's no continuous film winding, there's no motor drive obviously. There's no remote release socket, there's only one autofocus point which is in the middle. You might want to get a more advanced autofocus system. So if you bought the F50 thinking it's nice and simple to use in the simple mode and I can expand and grow into it in the advanced mode, well you can also grow out of it. By the time you realise that you want more autofocus points or continuous winding or a remote release socket, you might well have bought a second or even a third lens and a flash unit you have invested in the Nikon system. So when you come to buy your second SLR camera, you're probably going to buy a Nikon. So by having these very attractive uh, cameras at uh, very modest price points, it does sort of hook you into a specific system. I'm not levelling this as a criticism of Nikon, you get great value. And all the other manufacturers had great value entry-level SLRs as well. Uh, worth noting, also this feels nice and solid and you know, it is plastic obviously, but it feels like a solid camera. It's, uh, it feels good quality. Also, it was available in black. This is a champagne gold finish. It was available in a plain black finish. Should you buy one today? Well, just like in 1994, they do offer tremendous value for money. With that excellent manual exposure mode and the uh, quality of the viewfinder display, uh, it does uh, make a lot of sense to go for one of these cameras. They're easily available for around £50. This one I actually got for £8 on eBay, including delivery, just for the body. When it comes to lenses, you may well find it comes with a 35-80 to or a 28-80 to so-called kit to zoom lens. Well worth swapping that out for something a little bit better. Um, the obvious choice being a 50mm 1.8 but also there were mid-range zoom lenses that back in the 90s would have been in a sort of three to four hundred pound price point. Uh, the 24 to 105s or the 35 to 105 type zooms, they offered better optics than the kit zoom, but at a reasonable price. And if you want to go crazy, of course, there was always the 24 to 72.8, the 70 to 200 2.8. And today, those mid 90 uh, Nikon or Canon lenses, they can be had for relatively uh, fair prices. I've seen 7200 2.8 early versions going for two to three hundred pounds from a dealer with a warranty. So, as a vehicle for some nice lenses, why not an F50? The only thing is, of course, uh, you are going to run into those problems that I've mentioned with the autofocus single point with the non motor drive film transport with no remote release shutter or socket. Also worth looking at perhaps uh, an F80 or an F90, but you will pay a little bit more. But if you want something very affordable, that offers quite a lot of camera, uh, I think these are absolutely lovely. Anyway, that's been the Nikon F50. I hope this video has been of uh, use or interest to somebody. 
and thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. Have a good day.